Imagine yourself sitting on a tropical island. You hear the waves crashing against the shore. The oceanic breeze blows through your hair, and you can smell the salty air with a hint of some of the tropical scents wafting in from deeper on the island. The sun beats down and warms your skin. As you watch the sunset over the ocean horizon, what thoughts come to mind? Perhaps you thank God for the privilege of living upon his creation. Perhaps you think about what brought you to this island. Or maybe you think about what you could add to the scene to make it a little better. Perhaps a galleon sailing off into the unknown. Or maybe you're one of those types of people who think a large region of fucking ice would improve the view. <laughs> I only jest. There is a large subsection of the Sea of Thieves community that wants an ice region added to the game. Adding a new region of any kind would be a great addition to the sandbox, but an ice region would not be my first pick if I'm being honest. However, I am not against adding one. What I am against, however, is lazy implementation of new mechanics. I want an ice region to not only be fun, but also make sense in the game's world and be implemented well. I've decided to do some research in the Sea of Thieves geography and climate to explain why simply slapping an ice region north of the wilds would be stupid, as well as providing a method in which an ice region could be incorporated in a logical, lore-friendly, and still fun way. Without further ado, let's dive right in. Before I begin to explain how to add an ice region, allow me to take a moment to explain why a region like the Devil's Roar makes sense to just slap into the map. I'm sure we're all familiar with volcanoes, considering that the Devil's Roar is full of them. Volcanoes are caused by tectonic plate movement, usually from the plates colliding, grinding against, or subducting underneath each other. For the volcanoes of the Devil's Roar to exist logically, the Sea of Thieves must be somewhere near one of these, right? Turns out it is. The Sea of Thieves is described as a fold on the map somewhere in the Caribbean. While no piece of media related to the game explicitly states where exactly the Sea of Thieves is, it is suggested to be somewhere near Isla de Mosquito, aka Mosquito Island, which is owned by Richard Branson in the current day, and the British Virgin Islands. This would place it somewhere east of Puerto Rico, and what exactly is north of Puerto Rico and the Sea of Thieves by extension? Would you look at that? It's the Puerto Rican fault line, where the Caribbean plate subducts underneath the North American plate. Not only that, the string of islands southwest of Isla de Mosquito includes Guadalupe, Dominica, St. Lucia, Granada, Barbados, and a few others. They make up a string of volcanoes. This string begins in Trinidad and supposedly ends south of Anguilla. It would make sense that this string of volcanic activity also extends into the Sea of Thieves a little, creating the Devil's Roar region. The implementation of the Devil's Roar, even if it is basically similar to every other region with extra steps, makes a surprising amount of sense when you look into the science of it. Let's think about the climate of the Sea of Thieves, which is tropical. How do I know this? Let's take a look at the Earth on a globe. Sorry, flat earthers, but this is the part where you click off. The Caribbean, for reference, is south-southwest of Florida. Yeah, duh, I imagine we all know that, but think about where that puts the Caribbean in terms of how close it is to Earth's equatorial line. Pretty darn close. It's not directly on the equator, but it certainly isn't far enough away to be a more temperate climate like my home state of Colorado. One question you might have considering the topic of this video is, does it snow in the Caribbean? Actually, yes it does, but only in very specific places. Some of the tallest peaks in the Caribbean, like Pico Duarte, the largest mountain in the Caribbean, get light snowfall during cold spells, but this doesn't happen super often. The Blue Mountains of Jamaica are also occasionally visited by snow, but it doesn't stay on the ground for very long since the temperature rarely dips below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Valle Nuevo, a national park in Costanza, also reports light snowfall on occasion, but they have peaks that stand over 7,400 feet above sea level. It has also snowed in the Bahamas once in 1977. Overall, the general trend for snow in the Caribbean or similar areas around the world is that generally a high elevation is required, and even then it is a relatively rare occurrence. So where does this fit into the Sea of Thieves? Well, what are some of the tallest peaks in the confines of the Shroud? Tribute Peak is definitely up there. Crooked Masts, Galleon's Grave, Daggertooth Outposts, Ancient Spire, Devil's Ridge, any of the volcanoes in the Devil's Roar? I think we can safely rule out the Devil's Roar first, considering the vast amount of volcanic activity there. You'd be more likely to see ash falling than snow. As for every other island mentioned above, including Tribute Peak, I can safely estimate simply from a visual perspective that none of these islands really crest a thousand feet above sea level. If one of you is willing to do the math and calculate each island in feet, or whatever measurement you like, then you are more than welcome to. Math isn't necessarily my strong suit, I like zoology a lot more. 
Before we move on, I imagine a lot of people hold the opinion of, who cares how it's added? It's just a game. Rare can do whatever they want. It's fiction anyway. I feel like this opinion is simply an excuse to support poor and lazy game design. If Rare simply slapped an ice region into the northern part of the map, it would get stale within a few weeks to a month. Not only that, but we need to consider the impacts on game performance that would have. Rare needs to ensure that the game can run in a stable state on older generation hardware like the Xbox One. They are already having enough trouble getting six ships in a single server. Imagine what have adding a whole other region to the game's map would do to server stability and game performance. Couple the low amount of ships per server and the increased map size, that'd make it a much rarer occurrence to encounter players. With that said, let's move on to some of my ideas for actual implementation of an ice region. Sea of Thieves is a game known for its creative implementation of mechanics, as well as a trove of lore to explain the ones that need explaining. As such, there are many creative and fun ways to implement an ice region into the game, and many content creators have their own ideas. I'm sure a good chunk of us are familiar with the map from that one expansion pitch reddit post. The map describes the frozen wilds, with an arctic wind out of the north as frozen in northern wilds, and with it brought some new islands, as well as moving ice. Well, if anything I just explained tells us anything, it's that if an arctic cold front blew through the Sea of Thieves, the worst it might get is a temperature drop. So what are some more lore accurate rays we can incorporate in ice region? Fellow content creator Captain Falcor had one of the better ideas I've seen. Changes the playstyle into a team based PvE VP mission. Three to four ships can join the expedition, and it's up to these crews whether they want to help each other out or fight each other for the loot. Once the expedition is started, you and your crew sail through the portal and find yourself in a new icy tundra where the only true enemy is the elements. However, I'd like to take a moment to expand upon his idea of the use of portals further, as well as adding some of my own ideas on top of that. As far as I know, these portals are used to access the Sea of the Dam. The Pirate's Life and Legend of Monkey Island Tall Tales both use them for access in and out. In fact, the Legend of Monkey Island and the Sea of the Damned could be the very answer to our ice region problem. In the Tall Tales, Lashuk, the main antagonist of the Monkey Island series, steals the corrupted Sword of Souls, now called the Burning Blade which is not to be confused with Flameheart's personal vessel. LeChuck uses the Burning Blade to create a facsimile of Melee Island to trap Guybrush within his own memories. This is possible because the Sea of the Damned has the power to make memories real, and is shaped by the memories of its inhabitants. In fact, anyone with the proper power and know-how can manipulate the Sea of the Damned against their enemies. Flameheart does this a lot, actually. This is why LeChuck stole the Burning Blade. He didn't have the power to manipulate the Sea of the Damned himself, so he needed an artifact to give him the power to do so. So what if the ice region we want wasn't part of the main map, but instead a large region within the Sea of the Damned that we could travel to, created by the memories of deceased Vikings that inhabit that region? I've got enough common sense, and angry comments on the clothing stereotypes video, that Vikings did their fair share of pillaging. Unlike the pirates we play in Sea of Thieves though, they weren't just pirates, they were a society of explorers, colonizers, and conquerors. Take Leif Erikson for example, son of Eric the Red. Eric the Red founded the first settlement in Greenland, and Leif Erikson founded the settlement of Vinland, which is believed to have been founded in coastal North America, which leads us to believe he may have been the first European to set foot in continental America long before Christopher Columbus landed in the Bahamas and the pilgrims on the Mayflower. So I'd like to clarify to everybody watching this video that Vikings could be considered pirates by definition for their raids and pillaging, but they were much more than just petty raiders and are vastly different than the pirates of the age of piracy that we know from Sea of Thieves and Pirates of the Caribbean. But is it too much of a stretch to say that the Sea of the Damned could accept their souls as well? Perhaps a clan of Vikings sailing far south managed to find a way through the Shroud, and the only evidence of their adventures in the Sea of Thieves was the clothing they left behind that we now purchase from the shops at Outpost and their souls within the Sea of the Damned. In terms of gameplay, up to four player crews across the local server stamp would call upon the assistance of the pirate lore to open a gate to the Sea of the Damned for a PvEVP expedition that takes place on its own dedicated server, where players travel into this frozen region in search for legendary Viking treasure. Here, players encounter all the dangers of the frozen north. Ice drifts into your ship and damages it. 
falling into the freezing waters would deal continuous damage until the player exits the water or eventually dies, as well as slowing them down for a short time after exiting, similar to falling from a high height or getting hit with a limp ball, but with the added effect of slowing down every action rather than just moving, like reloading weapons, eating food, and bucketing, which comes into play later. The slowing effect would become more severe the longer the player stays in the water. For example, taking a quick dip to bucket a small amount of water wouldn't slow you down too much, but submerging yourself to repair would slow you down significantly. Managing a player's temperature would become an everyday challenge. Holding out a lantern could slow, but not completely eliminate the threat of the cold, requiring the use of campfires to stave off the freezing temperatures. The ice and cold isn't the only threat, though. Unique frozen wraiths conjured from the Sea of the Damned lower your temperature with every touch, making avoiding them all the more important if you want to get back to your ship alive. Not only that, but you'll be working with or against the three other crews with you on this expedition. The main goal is a large treasure vault hidden somewhere in the vast region of ice, with multiple puzzles in various areas needing to be solved to learn of its location. Here, where all the trouble of having four crews comes into play. The map is large, but encountering other players going for the main goal is inevitable, and how you deal with these crews is entirely up to you. Want to form a four crew alliance and split the loot evenly? How about forming an alliance only to betray it later, taking the massive hull for yourself, or will you battle the other crews the whole time, vying to take the whole hull? Across the large region are various other methods of gaining treasure, such as finding clues in the logs of deceased adventurers, surviving ice caves filled with various hazards, and battling the region's dangerous phantom viking inhabitants for unique bounty skulls, among other things. Allowing players to get some extra loot in addition to the main vault goal, or allowing players to avoid the main objective and collect loot while avoiding the other crews that they so choose. Once you return through the portal to the Sea of Thieves, you'll be deposited on a random server on your stamp. So any alliances you made in the ice region are broken, so negotiating and dividing up the loot accordingly when working together will be especially important. This also allows for more stealthy crews to sneak their way around, grab some loot, and make a beeline for the exit to secure their hull. Fighting other players is going to become more difficult, as boarding the ship will be more risky without the use of deck shots or harpoons to board is the freezing cold water will damage you and slow you down, making combat once you're aboard more difficult. The water's freezing properties will also apply to any water that floods into a ship from damage, making bucketing a more difficult task, as bailing the water takes longer if one stays in the water too long, and repairing when heavily damaged and filling will be significantly harder. This will encourage naval combat, and make it so player crews with the most skilled cannoneers and helmsmen will be more likely to make it out alive, rather than the ones with the best borders. Turning in the frozen loot you gain from these expeditions will unlock progress towards special ice region commendations, as you progress through the fire grades of loot commendations, you'll unlock special themed cosmetics for your pirate and ship, as well as a unique curse for each in grade 5 in each commendation, the Frozen Curse. Skeleton and Ghost Curse players earn some special cosmetics too. Turning in the Frozen Spoils to the Reaper's Bones will progress unique Reaper's commendations and unlock Frozen Skeleton cosmetics and Frozen Bones color for completing all the base loot commendations. Completing all the base loot commendations and visiting the zone while wearing the Ghost Curse will unlock a unique variation available to purchase from Legendary Luke, the Wraith Curse, turning your ghostly pirate from blue to gray. Some of my ideas for this loot include Nordic-themed gold hoarder chests that become increasingly ornate the more valuable they are with intricate carvings and runes, an ornate viking shield that can be sold or used to block attacks from swords and bullets. The shield would only cover the upper part of the user's body as well as only protecting from the front so an eagle-eyed sharpshooter could avoid the shield altogether, and the shield would break after a certain amount of hits. After the shield breaks, it takes a cracked appearance and sells for half its normal value. As mentioned earlier, unique Skull of the Damned bounty skulls from defeating certain phantom vikings would be a loot option, and a rare unique viking helmet which sells for a similar amount to the Crown of Hope, and your biggest chance of finding one of these helmets would be in the Island Vault. One specific idea I had for a unique cosmetic you could unlock from turning in this loot was a Nordic throwing axe skin for the new throwing knives, with unique animations but essentially the same function as the original. Other weapons would get some intricately carved Nordic variations as well.
My second idea might not be one of the most exciting ones, but it is somewhat geared towards the PvE crowd, so it's less competitive for a reason. You know how the Pirate Lord always yaps about reusing the artifacts you recover for him only for that to not happen very often, if at all? Well, this idea has the Pirate Lord actually acting on his word. My main main inspiration from this is from the Fallout 76 Expedition updates that allow players to venture to distant parts of post-war America like Pittsburgh and Atlantic City to do various quests. In this idea, the Merchant Alliance confronts the Pirate Lord with an offer for a hefty sum of gold, and I mean hefty, they wish to enlist the use of the Shroudbreaker to allow brave pirates to leave the confines of the Sea of Thieves and establish merchant contacts with the outside world, allowing the Merchant Alliance to gain access to goods all across the world. When accepting this quest, players are first tasked with sailing off the game map and into the Shroud, where they are instanced into a unique, large quest area similar to Chapter 3 of the Monkey Island Tall Tales. It is here where they meet with a potential merchant contact who will give them a task to complete, such as opening a unique Viking puzzle vault and obtaining a valuable artifact for them, or battling a merchant ship that soured them on a deal. In addition to the main task, you can find hidden collectibles and side tasks to complete for bonus gold and commendations. After completing your main objectives, players return to the contact and are paid a sum of gold based on all objectives completed and get to keep any extra treasure they find to be sold later. Naturally, following the theme of this video, the first location players could visit would be the frozen north of Greenland or Iceland, but this idea opens up a bunch of new ideas for the regions players could visit, anywhere from battling merchant ships off the coast of Spain to the dense jungles of the Congo. New thematic cosmetics from each expedition serve as the proof of your travels and are unlocked with appropriate commendations. What do you guys think? If you guys have any more ideas for a nice region, such as cosmetics, treasure to find, enemies to encounter, be sure to comment them below, and thanks for watching this far in. I greatly appreciate it. And as a friendly reminder, I have a Discord server, link is in the description, and I will see you all next time.